As a boy, I yearned to use my father's workshop, but he forbade me for fear of messing up his tools. I had no mum to fight my corner. At the back of our house in the next street was a laundry and I often escaped there as Ken, the boiler man, a Polish refugee, allowed me to use his workshop. Ken was a kind man and he allowed me to use his tools, showing me how to file bits of metal in the vise and drill them on an antiquated drill press. This was an important early influence for me. After a somewhat troubled childhood and nearly being kicked out of grammar school, a great aunt's trust paid for the last three years of secondary education at a progressive school in Derbyshire. And then an uncle in Scotland offered me a home when my father died when I was 17. I scraped into the sixth form at Abbott's Home School after spending many of the lessons fly fishing for trout on a stretch of the River Dove that the school owned. I, I guess fishing was my escape from, um, well, troubles. Suddenly, a rather eccentric but brilliant woodwork teacher appeared at the school. I had already failed GCE O level with the rest of the class the year before, but Howard Orm brought woodworking alive, and in two terms I became the school's first A level woodwork candidate, uh, gaining a grade A, and normally it was a two year course. Howard gave me the workshop keys one weekend and I worked throughout the nights completing my first acoustic guitar. I then followed in his footsteps and trained to be a teacher at the legendary Shoreditch College. My, that's another story. Um, after three years specialising on the advanced wood course, I gained a distinction. So I was lucky, you know, in my teenage years and my entry into manhood, if you like, I discovered a real talent, or rather it was discovered by a brilliant teacher. So I entered teaching and landed up as the youngest teacher at Millfield School, one of the top independent schools in Britain known for um, its sporting achievements. The swimmer Duncan Goodhue was there in the sixth form when I was there. Now, had I remained a carpentry teacher, that's what I was called, I would never have got to meet a prime minister or members of the royal family, and I probably wouldn't have been arrested for armed robbery in Finland some years later, uh, mistaken identity, of course. It was while I was teaching woodwork, or rather carpentry, at Millfield School that I first felt the itch to set up a workshop and try to earn a living from making furniture. The classes at Millfield were very small, up to six students, and the work was highly individual, but I wanted to make things myself rather than just teach the students. So perhaps inevitably, I left the secure corridors of education and what for me was a passive role as a teacher and I risked the hand-to-mouth existence of a self-employed craftsman. Now, in retrospect, I think a strong motivating factor was uh, the thing I totally believed in. My passion for working in wood was treated as the Cinderella of the educational curriculum. And, you know, I, th I, th I think it's still the case today. In fact, it's been largely chased out of the curriculum. So, although I was blind to the road ahead at that time, I could not face spending the rest of my working life beating my head against this particular brick wall. So, I threw my cars to the wind. After Millfield, I spent six months helping set up a crafts commune near Glastonbury. I was one of 12 artist craftsmen. We rented studio space, setting up our respective crafts hoping to secure commissions through shops, galleries and exhibitions, or through whatever publicity the director of the commune could dream up. We were the first residential crafts commune in Britain and written up about in the colour supplements. It was the brainchild of Tony Horrocks, an ex-Hornsey Art College lecturer, uh, famous for the 1968 
student sit-ins and also his wife Pauline. The Dove Centre was a dream during a decade of dreams, the 1970s. A public space where amateurs could learn alongside professionals, sharing the equipment and mixing educational and commercial ob objectives. I was certainly sold the dream and gave my labour freely, building about 22 ledge and brace doors for the buildings, a fitted kitchen and a long refectory table with 24 chairs based on the 13th century Glastonbury chair. I also collaborated with other makers such as the weaver uh, Candice Behuth and a printmaker called Alan who designed a King Arthur tapestry upholstery for my new Glastonbury chair. Uh, I made that out of piranha pine incidentally. But we were situated out in the sticks and presumed our customers would seek us out. Our products were overpriced uh, because the Dove Centre took a percentage on top of what a gallery or retailer would add. The Dove philosophy evolved somewhat undemocratically and soon those deemed as strong crafts, uh, such as myself, uh, which wasn't true, uh, furniture was very difficult to sell, but I had to bear a higher percentage markup than so-called weaker crafts, such as printmaking. And while some craftspeople rose late in the day to get out of bed, others were more disciplined. It was too much of a dream and my livelihood and finances suffered. So sadly, I was the first to leave, which led to a mass exit. So I wasn't exactly the most popular guy on the planet. I returned to London. I got a room for two pounds per week in a flat in Bayswater, uh, sharing with some gorgeous young female social workers. And I joined up with some old friends who had a workshop just off the King's Road in Chelsea. I helped make fitted wardrobes in Belgravia and we developed some furniture ideas. But somehow my heart was set in the West Country, although I'm a Scotsman. And one warm summer's day, I headed down the M4 uh, towards Bath with a suitcase, some hand tools from my Shoreditch College days and a radial arm saw on my trailer. Yeah.